Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm Mike Broadbent. Joining me is Chris Nowaski, Rutgers beat writer. Chris, Rutgers had a must-win game this weekend against uh, Indiana. I was about to say Illinois, but we didn't play them. Uh, against Indiana, uh, they came out on top 24-17 to for their first home conference win since 2017. Uh, we'll get into that and more, but uh, first, this podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Uh, basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, game trends at, get, at Bet Online. As your continued source for all your sports wagering info, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. It's always the best and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. You can head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Make sure you use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. Now let's get right into this game because I don't think you could have scripted up a worse start for how a game could go for Rutgers. Uh, they had the opening kickoff, go for a touchdown for Indiana, so that was a quick 7-0. Then they had a, a drive that stalled out quickly, and then Indiana marched down the field for a 91-yard touchdown uh, to go up 14-0. Uh, so they really did, like, from the second quarter on, just dominate this game, though, Rutgers. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you saw from this game and, and why that's kind of promising moving forward, Chris. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it seems like every fan, you know, early on in that first first quarter was going to leave the stadium. They were going to, you know, call for, you know, Shano's head or whatever. So, but... They, they really did a good job bouncing back. I mean, like we said, he couldn't have got off to a worse start, um, of course. And then, of course, you know, the offense stalls themselves with the new offense coordinator. Oh, everyone's clamoring, you know, oh, nothing's changed, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, Rutgers, Rutgers really buckled down. Um, it, 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 start, it, starts with the, it, it starts with the defense, I'd say, honestly, because, um, you know, uh, Indiana runs, um, you know, a very high-tempo offense, and, like the players and everybody will say the right thing in practice, you know, we'll be ready and whatnot. But until you really like go out and play against the high tempo in the game, like you don't, you can't really get like a true feel for it. You could watch film and everything, but, um, but yeah, I mean, Connor, Connor Bazelak for Indiana was 10 for 10 in the first quarter for almost hundred yards. And after that, he did absolutely nothing. You know, Indiana scored, you know, three points the rest of the way. And that was, you know, late in the fourth quarter on, you know, for, for field goal, but you know, uh, Rutgers made a lot of a lot of really good defensive uh, adjustments. You know, um, a lot's been talked about Coach Harrisimiak and the job he's done. You know, calling the plays on defense. Um, they went to kind of you know more man to man. They 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 brought a lot more pressure. I mean, Aaron, Aaron Lewis, you know, was was in the backfield a lot, hitting hitting the quarterback. Um, Wesley Bailey made a couple of nice plays late, and then of course Christian Brassel had the pick six to kind of kind of kind of. You know, still the game, I guess you could say. It, it gave Rutgers the lead, you know, near the end of the game. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the defense just played a little well. The offense did what needed to go in terms of the run game. They kept the ball. Um, you know, freshman running back Sam Brown looked really good. Um, he had um, – he got his first start. He had 28 carries for over, over 100 yards. Um, you know, he was, he was moving the pile. And, you know, the offense or the, or the crowd, you know, really, really enjoyed that. So, um, actually, so, someone asked him about that after the game, and Sam Brown said, like, like um, he kind of blocks everything out, but he can tell that the fans were like, you know, cheering and everything for him. So he, you know, he mm -hmm. thought that was that was pretty cool. He could kind of sense it. Um, but yeah, he did. He did really well. Um, Sean Ryan had had a good game. I thought they should have gave him the ball more. Then you know, the three passes or the three, yeah, I think he had three catches, and they were all like really early. He had the, he had the touchdown. Um, I've, I've been calling for Aaron Cruikshank to really get the ball on jet sweeps for, for weeks since really the, the first game where he, he had like one and he scored and they haven't done it since. So it was really, it was really good to see that. Um, and they, um, I don't know if you guys, anybody here watched the Kansas City Chiefs game, but they, they literally did that a bunch of times with Nicole Hardman. Nicole Hardman, yeah, yeah. That, that's what Cruikshank should have been doing for, you know, seven, seven games now every time. So. Uh, that's something that you know Nunjo Campanelli really put in there for him, and, and that really helped. But um, yeah, I mean th this is a big win that Rutgers needed to have. Um, it didn't. It started very ugly. Um, it looked like it was. It looked like Rutgers was going to be three and four, but they're four and three and still have a fighting chance with uh, with a couple more, I guess, quote unquote, winnable games left in the season. Yeah, I was uh, just taking notes as the game was going on, and I was just 
crafting up this like real long monologue, <laughs> just really fire and brimstone about how disappointed and pissed off I was about this team, but they really did clean it up over the second half. Uh, so let's talk about the offense because obviously Sean Ryan or Sean Gleason got fired after the Nebraska game. We had two weeks to prep for this Indiana game. Um, we saw some things that were pretty clear that were deviations from what we were doing. So mm -hmm. first off was the quarterback carousel. It seems like it's over for right now. Uh, Greg said that because we got down big so early, we couldn't really afford to, to take any risks. Mm -hmm. so I think that played a part in why Noah Vedral stayed in the whole game. But I also think he just – he runs what they're trying to do best. Like the number one thing Shiano said about playing quarterback for him is not turning the ball over, and Noah's shown that he – has the uh, the wherewithal and the smarts to kind of even if it's <laughs> even if he runs out of bounds, he's not going to throw it into traffic. Or if he yeah. throws it, you know, ten ten rows into the stands, he's not going to throw a ball really in uh, harm's way. Although he did have one interception that was dropped. Yeah, yeah, he threw, um, he threw it behind Langan a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think that was crucial that we saw is that Sam Brown has clearly established himself as the running back one on this team, and rightfully so. Uh, you know, we saw uh, Ashley Salam get mixed in, Kyle Manungai get mixed in, and those guys just, they can't really make defenders miss. They'll take what's there for them, but Sam Brown has that ability to, to stiff arm guys, to, to brush off blocker, or to brush off first uh, defenders that nobody else has on this team. 89 of his 101 rushing yards this Saturday were after contact, which is insane. That's, you know, 90% of his rushing yards came after first contact, and... He's just – Greg also said something about, you know, he what one thing he looks at with running backs is guys who fall backwards or fall forwards. And Sam Brown consistently falls forwards, which is an additional, you know, yard and a half every time you're carrying the ball. Yep. So I think that is going to continue. It sounds like, based on what Greg said today, Sam Brown looks like he's going to be okay for this weekend. Uh, but I think one of the other things we saw was that even though the offense was simplified, we still had a lot of struggles in the past game. Uh, Noah Vedral threw a lot of balls inaccurately, and I don't know if that's due to his hand fatigue still, but there was a lot of balls that he sailed, a lot of balls that were just, like, totally off target. Um, so I, I do think that we're still going to continue to struggle passing, and that's partially because none of the young quarterbacks are fully there, and Noah just clearly has some deficiencies passing. What else yeah. did you notice from the offense that really stood out to you that was a, a change-up from the first half of the season? Yeah, the yeah the one thing that really caught me right away is um, they took some stabs, you know, under center. Uh, that's that's not something they've done in the past. Um, they use it seemed like they used play action more, um, which is you know if you can run the ball and then use play action, you can normally get somewhat easy easy completions, you know, into to tight ends. Um, actually, they threw the ball to Giant Langan a bunch of times. You know, I think he might have had more catches, you know, in this game or more targets than he had, you know, all all year. It's something. I, you know, I said check, or one of us could probably check as we're going. But, uh, yeah, yep. they threw the ball to Langan a lot. Um, you know, they use, like I said, they use Cookshank. So, um, th this offense, like you said, the offensive line is very is is very good at run blocking. Um, uh, but in terms of pass protection, um, um, you know, they're obviously not 100 percent there yet. Um, Shano, Shano did say that all the quarterbacks were healthy. Um, and this was like the first time that they were healthy. Um, and they could have been used, but. Uh, they 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 stuck it out with Noah and uh, they got the job done. Um, he you know Shiano did say today that that you know it might not be the case going forward. The other guys still might be in there. Um, but one thing though that was telling he did he did um, uh, he did he did come out and say that Gavin Wimsat was the number two quarterback and Simon was the number three quarterback. So he actually gave us um, you know some some depth chart info there that he probably didn't didn't maybe realize he did, but <laughs> he did. He did anyway, but uh, yeah, I mean the offense was was wasn't too much different, but there was some some wrinkles, and um, there were there were s some good ones on. So like I said, with with Cookshank, they gave the ball to Sam Brown, uh, took snaps under center. So I think we'll see you know those things going going forward again. Yeah, I, th I think I was also reading that um, Gavin looked pretty good, or Chiano made a point to say that Chiano or. Wimsat looked good in like a developmental practice this Saturday, like one of his best practices he's had. So it sounds like they're based on everything Shiano's saying, like he wants to get Gavin more snaps somehow. 
And I, I think he probably would have played more if we didn't get down to such a big deficit early in the game. Like if we had a game like Indiana last year where we're up by like multiple scores for most of the game, we probably would have seen more Wimsat. But because we needed, we couldn't afford to make any more mistakes that we uh, just wrote out Vedral for the whole game. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So you kind of talked about like winnable games moving forward. So Rutgers is four and three on the season, one and three in Big Ten competition. We need two more wins to secure bowl eligibility. So I would say the three games left on the schedule that are winnable, quote unquote, is this upcoming game against Minnesota, at uh, Michigan State, and at Maryland. So they're all road games. The two remaining home games you have are. Uh, home against Michigan, which is uh, November 5th, which I guess we can take a slight detour here. Just got announced as a 7.30 game on BTN, so it'll be yep. our third night game this season. So that should be a pretty uh, cool environment, especially if we show some life against Minnesota, um, which I think we will. Mm -hmm. And then we have a home game against uh, Penn State as well. So what is your read on – where would you put Rutgers' chances on making a bowl if you had to give a prediction right now, give a percentage chance, I'd say? Percentage chance? Um, I think we definitely have a shot against Minnesota and Michigan State. I don't know about Maryland because Maryland just blew Rutgers out of the water last year, and they probably will get Talia Tagovailoa back at that point. I know he didn't play this past week. and I mean, they still beat Northwestern without him. So um, they definitely have a good team, a good, good offense. Um, but, um, I mean, def I mean, percentage wise, uh, I don't know. If I'm, <laughs> I'm not good at percentages here, but I think, I think definitely the two, two most winnable games is Minnesota and Michigan state. Um, you know, the last time that, uh, Rutgers went to Michigan state was a season over a couple years ago. And, uh, they had like what, seven, seven takeaways on defense and they really, and they really did a good job there. Uh, Michigan state isn't what they were last year. Um, definitely not. They have, you know. The best players in the NFL right now, and he really made that team at running back, you know, Kenny Walker. Um, but yeah, I think I think those two games are definitely more winnable games. And for whatever reason, Rutgers plays better on the road too, so maybe maybe they do sneak that Maryland game. Um, but you know, last time you know Rutgers had five wins last year going up against Maryland, and obviously you know that didn't end well there. So you can never count on on beating Maryland. Um, but yeah, so de definitely, I'd say at, at least those two games, and I think I think it even possibly could throw Penn State in, into the mix. I mean, they have a really good team, obviously, but it's gonna it's it's a home game for Rutgers, and um, you know everyone knows every every Rutgers fan, I guess, knows the hatred toward toward the Nittany Lions. Um, so I mean, I'm sure I'm sure the team will 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 be up for that one. And uh, I mean, I mean, Rutgers did beat Michigan in the past. Now Rutgers, I mean, uh, Michigan has a much better team. Um, than they did in 2014 when Rutgers beat them, but um, it is a night game. Uh, the atmosphere should be sh should be a good one. So, I mean, anything is possible at this point. But um, I'd say definitely Minnesota and Michigan State are your are your two best bets. Yeah, I'd agree that those are probably the two games the, the coaching staff is looking at as opportunities to win because if Tagovailo is back, that's going to be a very high powered yeah. offense. And the last game of the season, you don't want to you know rest your hopes on the last game of the year yep. again. Um, and Minnesota's currently dealing with a rash of injuries. Their quarterback missed last week, uh, who's one of the top-rated quarterbacks in all of uh, college football, and Tanner Morgan, who's like a fifth-year senior. He missed uh, the game against Penn State due to concussion. Their backup is a redshirt freshman who's not very good. Um, and Michigan State, they've lost four of their last five. Their next two games are going to be at Michigan and at Illinois, who are both ranked. Um, so they could come into the game really beat up and kind of down in the dumps, sitting at like three and six against Rutgers in that game. Mm -hmm. So that'll be uh, something to take a look at. But something I do want to talk about from this past game is how well the defense played, especially with adjustments. It seemed like to start the game, they were playing a lot of zone, a lot of soft coverage, and they did a great job of adjusting and uh, playing a lot more man, putting a lot more pressure on the quarterback in the, the last three quarters of the game. Because like you said, he started off the game 10 for 10 for like 97 yards. Uh, the run game started off, like, I think seven carries for 39 yards and a touchdown. And over the last three quarters, they went 13 for 31 in terms of passing with an interception. And I think they rushed for 21 carries for 39 yards. So they were under two yards a carry over the, the last three quarters. Um, and this is just a continued uh, excellent job by Coach Harris Simiak and his, his staff because – 
all year we've been just really doing well on defense. I think we're the number seven overall in terms of total defense this year. Yep. And that's including think, a game against number seven now. Yep. And that's including a game against one of the best offenses in football in Ohio State. But we did hold Ohio State to over 100 yards less than their average on the season. So what are you seeing from the defense that's really making them as dominant as they've been all season? Yeah, so every time we talk to the players, they always talk about, um, you know, how Coach Harris Simeak just wants them to communicate on the field, play hard, and swarm to the ball. And that's exactly what, and that's exactly what, what we're seeing. They always, you know, we always talk to Deion, Deion Jennings a lot and – always talks about communicating with Tyreen Powell and then calling the defense out to the rest of the guys. And I think it's all, I think they're all playing team defense and they're all enjoy each other's success. And um, I think, I think that plays a big role when you have a chemistry and you have guys that are clicking on defense. Um, it really, it really makes a big difference there. Um, you know, coach Harris, Simi, I know, I know Minnesota was um, really upset. I, I guess you could say that they lost Harris Simiak and now he gets to go up against them and, and, we, and we'll see how he does in there. But, um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of younger guys are, st- are stepping up, and they have more years of eligibility. I mean, um, you know, Robert Longerbeam came back this week. Um, he was out for for a couple of games, but to start the season, he was the team's best best cornerback. Um, even even a, a lot better than Max Bellin, who a lot of people pegged to be, you know, a, a, maybe a draft pick this year. But Longerbeam was outplaying him by by a long shot. Um, Aaron Aaron Lewis has been a monster this year at, at the end. Um, I think I think we had talked earlier. You said he was what, like number fourteen, um, in terms of Pro Football Focus. I think. Yeah, in terms of PFF, he's the number fourteen overall defensive end out of like five hundred eligible defensive ends. And Christian Braswell is the number two overall corner mm. out of uh, around six hundred qualifying cornerbacks. So these guys are really performing well uh, in the eyes of not only our fans but also nationally as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, Christian Braswell had came up with the big pick six to in the game, like I mentioned. Um, you know, he he was banged up. He was supposed to play last year, but you know, he he got banged up. Um, he can He's you know every time he's played this year, he's done really well. Um, he started he started this, this past week, played played the most snaps, and I think he had the highest PFF grade on the team. So I think he had another three three pass breakups, a couple tackles. So he's played really well and, and the second day oh, second day overall has been has played really well i mean Kess abraham has um he he missed this past game but um it sounds like he might be able to go to go th- this game coming up um christian christian Izian has been st- you know steady eddie all, all season long um a- avery young has made has made some plays so um you know wesley bailey he's he comes up with like late game changing sacks late late in the game um he's kind of a I think he's like a redshirt sophomore. I mean, he's he's still young and getting better. There's a lot of young guys on the D line. Um, you know, someone like Maya Hines, too. He's he doesn't even get a tons of playing time with Kante Hamilton and Ifan Ifan Major ahead of him. So, um, I think a lot of they just they just rotate. And a lot of young guys are getting better, and they all play together and communicate. And um, I think that's really contributed to how they how they have how they've played well so far. Yeah, they've been super opportunistic. Um... In terms of the defensive backs, like all of our starting corners have multiple interceptions on the year. That's Max Melton, that's Robert Longerbeam, that's Christian Braswell. We've got, you know, Shaquan Loyal had the pick six against Temple, who's a who's a reserve. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're they're making do of most of the opportunities they get. They're not there's not many dropped interceptions. There have been a couple, but mm-hmm. most of the time they're catching them and making big plays, which has been huge. Um, I do think our defensive ends have really kind of blossomed in front of our eyes this year between Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey. I'd say we have one of the best combos in the Big Ten in terms of the edge rushers. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that's kind of been underscored a bit and kind of should be talked about more is how well our linebackers are playing. Like, Mm -hmm. we only played two linebackers on Saturday. They started the whole game. It's been the same two guys all season, Tyreen Powell and Deion Jennings. Now, if, if Singleton got that extra year of eligibility, I'm sure he would have been playing a lot too. Mm-hmm. But these guys have done a really good job at not only like playing well, they're obviously in great condition because they're playing the whole game, and that's been the same way they've been playing all year. But they've obviously done a great job uh, keeping themselves in good shape throughout the year yep. too because it's so easy to get hurt as a linebacker who's in on every almost every single play defensively. Uh, but these guys have stayed healthy, and if those two can st- continue to stay healthy – I think that'll be a huge key to the defense continuing the performance it has all year. Yeah, um, we also yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, uh, so I think we also got Des Igbenusen back for this mm, game for the first true. time, um, and he made a few big plays. 
Um, there's really just not enough you could say about this team on defense. Like they've just really performed at a high level all year. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, uh, I was looking at the Indiana stats again. I mean, Indiana had, Indiana just had 85 yards of total offense in the second half and they had, um, negative two yards, uh, um, hold on, negative eight yards rushing in the, in the second half. Um, they had the ball wow. for a minute and 15 in the third quarter alone and Rutgers just, ate up time possession and kept them off the field. So, um, I mean, when, when Rutgers was finally able to get on the field on defense, they shut down Indiana right away. And um, that obviously went a, a big way to, to get in the win there too. Yeah, a huge win for the program. Keeps the bowl hopes alive. And honestly, it keeps the fan base engaged because I think Shiano would have had a huge problem with the fan base. Uh, this Just keeping interest the rest of the season if, if they lost this one because it would have set, I believe, an all-time record for the most consecutive home games lost in conference in college football history. I think Rutgers oh, are wow. tied for that. So uh, <laughs> it's great that we're not alone at that uh, mountaintop or mountain bottom, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the fans are back reinvigorated. Um, we break the three-game losing streak. I don't think we've won a game since the beginning of October or the beginning or the end of September. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, and we kind of. We have a, a tough game coming up in, in Minnesota. I do think Minnesota is is ripe for the picking. Um, they've lost three straight games. The line opened at Rutgers as a 10-point underdog, and it's quickly moved to 14.5 points. So clearly there's been some sharp money coming in on Minnesota. Um, but we'll get further into that uh, later in the week. Um, was there anything else that Shiano said during either of the press conferences that you thought was interesting regarding the win or uh, the team moving forward? Yeah, just just I guess I guess a couple couple things. A, a lot he talked a lot about you know the offensive coordinator changes with Nuzio. Um, he said you know obviously everyone's everyone's you know you, you can only tweak tweak so many things. Um, you know maybe they'll have more as guys get get healthy or guys get more more adjusted to the change. Um, I know in terms of in terms of Minnesota, they have a lot of former coaches at Rutgers, coaches under Shiano there as well. So that's kind of similar to like to the Boston College game in in week one with a couple guys there. So you know the head coach, both coordinators are former Rutgers guys. Um, so Kirk Sharaka, Joe Rossi, and then of course PJ Flex. So that's something an, another interesting dynamic there, which you know uh, just just adds more intrigue, I guess, for the for the fans, but. Um, uh, I guess other than that, not, not really. Um, he talked about Sam Brown, um, also being a basketball player in high school. So there's, there's one thing in terms of the athleticism. And I guess, I guess one thing about Brown too, um, he's playing as well as he is. Um, and he had a late start. He didn't get to Rutgers until the summer when, um, a lot of others, you know, came in, came in January or, or whatnot. So, um, he, he, he came along quickly and, uh, he's really affected this team in a positive way. Yeah, and it's weird how quickly college football has changed in that aspect where it's 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 seen as you're the outlier if you show up when all the other college students do <laughs> right, rather right. than how it used to be the outlier if you enrolled early. Um, but, yeah, another guy who is an incredible high school athlete, I think he was all Catholic, Philly Catholic League in both football and basketball, um, playing for LaSalle High mm-hmm. School. Um, he's just been – honestly, he's just been a godsend for this offense because we – we needed somebody like him, and it, I know that there was some speculation when he was a, in a high as a high school recruit that he didn't really he was a four star, but didn't really have like the committable offers that you would expect for a guy like him. And I mm-hmm. think he's shown all those doubters that uh, they were wrong about him pretty quickly. And he's one of those guys that uh, Knights of the Raritan, I could imagine, will be talking to <laughs> after this season to make sure that he's. He's in a uh, a Rutgers Scarlet Knight uniform at least for three years. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because I think he's got he's got NFL talent, and I could see him leaving early for the league. But I hope he sticks around. Same with a guy like Aaron Lewis, Wesley Bailey. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be cool to see how uh, the NIL situation works out for Rutgers. Sure. Yep. Um, but speaking of that, I wanted to do like a weekly segment now that the the transfer portal has kind of started to heat back up, and I know the transfer portal rules have changed a bit where you can't enter the portal until after the season unless your coach got fired or unless you graduated from your college already. So you're going to see less early entrance into the portal, but two guys that Rutgers has started to show interest in uh, is quarterback Jack Tuttle, who's the backup for Indiana, 
Um, he started, I think, 17 games in his college career. Um, he's been at Indiana. He, he started off his career at Utah, and he's played the last three years at uh, Indiana. He's not really, like, the highest – He's not really like the best quarterback. Um, he's had a lot of struggles in his career. He's only a 55% career passer on uh, 170 attempts in college. He's the kind of guy who you bring in as a veteran stabilizing presence um, just to have a veteran guy who you can rely on if the younger guys are either struggling or get hurt. Um, but I think quarterback recruiting in the portal is really tough because you can really go one of two ways where you can essentially recruit a guy and promise him that he's going to play right away. Because uh, quarterback, only one guy gets the ball. Only one guy can play quarterback. It's not like receivers or cornerbacks or any other position, really. So if you're basically promising a quarterback, you can start right away. You could probably get a decent one. Um, if you try and get a guy to be a depth piece, it's going to be really tough, and the pickings are going to be pretty slim. Um, so you're going to have to go for guys like Jack Tuttle who probably aren't starter quality, but you'd want to be in your locker room and to be a mentor for younger quarterbacks. So that's kind of what I see him as, and we'll see. Because obviously we need a quarterback in this class, whether that be a high school guy or whether that be a transfer guy. Uh, and right now we don't have a high school commit. We offered a few guys, and then we backed off of them. Um, but I guess we'll kind of have to see how that goes. The other guy it looks like we're showing interest in is a defensive back from Louisville. His name's Nicario Harper. So he's had a pretty long, windy uh, path to, to where he's at right now. So he signed out of high school uh, to go to the Southern Miss. He spent two years there, ended up transferring to Jacksonville State. Uh, he didn't really play much at Southern Miss, but he immediately became a superstar at the FCS level. Uh, he won Conference Player of the Year, uh, the Ohio Valley Conference Player of the Year, at Jacksonville State, and he also was a first-team AP All-American. Uh, he's, he entered the transfer portal last year to use his fifth year to go to Louisville. Um, he hasn't seen much playing time there this year, and he announced that he's going to be entering the portal again after four games to preserve that eligibility. He's the kind of guy that's going to see a lot of interest. Um, obviously, Rutgers could probably use a safety next year. They're going to lose out on uh, Avery Young, who's uh, graduating. I think they lose out on Christian Izian as well, if uh, if memory serves me correctly. So I they're going to so. need. It's, it's, it's really hard to know, like when the COVID years and red shirts nowadays. I, I know. I, I I think definitely. I think I think definitely Avery's gone. I I think Izian too, but he's he, he's like a maybe for Izian. I forget. Yeah. So at the very least, we definitely need another uh, veteran safety back there. Although I do think Desmond Igbenusen will step in nicely um, after this season, but. Mm -hmm. So those are the two guys that the staff has reached out to. I'd say Harper probably could be, at worst, like a rotational player for the secondary, and at best, a, a you know a middle of the pack Big Ten starter. Um, but he's got a ton of interest, so we'll see how that progresses. But I'm gonna try and make this a segment that we kind of go over regularly. I know Chris is not uh, the recruiting analyst, but uh, <laughs> he could provide a little bit of a of uh, Intel where he's got it, but Richie would be primarily the, the person we could bounce these off of. But since he's uh, feeling a little under the weather today, I'm just using Chris as my sounding board. <laughs> uh, so thanks again for tuning in, guys. It's, it was an awesome win this past weekend. Chris, is there anything else you wanted to go over before we sign off today? Yeah, just really quickly, uh, you know, don't forget, and this is kind of like a week, a week away a little bit, but don't forget Sunday, uh, October 30th is when Rutgers plays uh, basketball plays Fairfield in the uh, exhibition game. Um, so I guess uh, if you haven't got a chance to, I guess, get get your seat, you could, you know, don't forget to do that. Um, it should be, it's a good time to kind of see, see you know, for fans to see the team in, you know, in the, in, in, in game action before the season actually starts. So uh, there's, uh, I guess there's one thing I should mention. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's really probably the only way that you're going to get to, uh, get a decently priced 100 level seat. Uh, I think yeah. they have floor seats available for $50. I don't know if those are still available, uh, but it all goes to the Christopher Reeve foundation, uh, supporting Eric Legrand and his, his, um, his mission to, uh, cure paralysis. So yep. it's a great cause. Uh, Eric's obviously an awesome guy. So if you can make it out there, it's going to be a really well done event. I, I assume they're going to kind of do something like this every year because 
why not if it's successful? Sure. So that'll that'll be the 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 pre the only preseason game that's available to the public. And then opening night, I believe, is November seventh. Yes, I, I believe correctly. so. I believe so. Yep. So November seventh is the first uh, basketball game of the season. So it's right around the corner. We'll have a a more proper uh, season preview, kind of breaking down where uh, some of our toughest opponents are, some of our best players. So stay tuned for that. That'll be coming in the next probably week or so. But uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. This has been another edition of the Night Report podcast. Signing off.